Olá, bom dia, pessoal. Tudo bem? Bom, bem, dia. bom dia, Afonso. Bom dia. É, eu gostaria, primeiro de tudo, agradecer ao professor Afonso por ter aceito o convite e agradecer ao pessoal que organiza aqui o Seminário SPAM por ter é, me convidado para apresentá-lo. Né? Então, o professor Afonso ele é engenheiro elétrico pela Universidade Federal de Pernambuco, fez seu uh, PhD, né, seu doutorado em Engenharia Biomédica pela Universidade de Carnegie Mellon, em Pittsburgh. Eu tive o prazer de trabalhar com ele durante meu doutorado no National Institute of Health, lá nos Estados Unidos, por onde foi pesquisador por um bom tempo, né, e hoje ele é professor do Departamento de Neurobiologia da Universidade de Pittsburgh. Então, assim, muito obrigada mesmo, Afonso, por ter aceito. É, é sempre um prazer ver você apresentando as coisas e enfim, matar um pouco a saudade do que é, a gente fez também, e ver as, a continuidade. Então, obrigada e, quando quiser, só começar. Ah, tá bom, Renata. Obrigada a você. Eu gostaria de dar um bom dia a todos que estão presentes e agradecer a você, Renata, por esse convite, que sempre me honra muito em, em estar aqui. É um prazer enorme também é, manter a, a relação né, com, com vocês, com, como a ex-estudante no laboratório, é sempre bom ver que você está indo tão bem e, e liderando esse curso aí em Ribeirão Preto. Né? Então, é, você está vendo minha apresentação do PowerPoint agora? Estou sim. Está, né? É, eu, eu vou pedir desculpas a, a todos os atendentes dessa palestra, mas eu vou ter que mudar para inglês, porque eu já estou aqui nos Estados Unidos desde 1992, então, se eu for dar essa palestra em português, vai demorar o dobro do tempo, então eu vou mudar para a língua nativa aqui. Então, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Afonso Silva. I'm an endowed chair of translational neuroimaging and professor of the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, I use uh, marmosets as a main uh, research model for understanding the anatomical and functional organization of the uh, primate brain. And uh, the uh, talk that I bring today to you is describing two projects that my group has been working on, the marmoset brain mapping project and the marmoset brain connectome project, which were projects that use high spatial resolution magnetic resonance imaging and functional magnetic resonance imaging to understand the anatomical and functional organization of the primate brain. So as uh, Brazilians that we all are, we all know uh, marmosets really well. All you need to do is go out on the street and look up the trees and there they are. Uh, you know, and it, it, it turns out that marmosets not only are a great uh, animal um, in Brazil, but they are also a biomedical supermodel in the sense that they have many features that uh, make them particularly attractive for neuroscience research. Um, they are really ideal as a non-human primate model uh, because they are small and uh, because they are small, they are very tractable and easy to keep in captivity, easy to keep in the laboratory. It's easy to uh, maintain a relatively large colony of animals that will support our research. Um, in addition to the fact that they are small, um, you know, they have many features of uh, primates that really make them uh, an attractive model in neuroscience. And that includes that they have the stereotypical anatomical and functional organization of the brain, but also, you know, in many other features. Uh, marmosets, for example, are a great model for social behavior and social communication because they live in many societies that in many aspects resemble our own society. Uh, marmosets, they form monogamous um, uh, pairs of mates that, you know, are very prolific in breeding, um, not only they breed a lot, they uh, breed fast as well. Um, the uh, gestation time is about 145 days, less than five months. And um, they usually uh, have offsprings that come in multiples of either twins or triplets. Um, and a breeding pair um, can give you offspring every six months. So they breed twice per year. And, and, and this is really 
builds up in in having as a non-human primate you know all this uh, practical advantages over the other uh, primate models that you see in our science research for example the macaque the rhesus macaque um just about uh, 12 years ago or so um there was a seminal paper in nature um, using the marmoset and therefore this biomedical supermodel term is not mine it belongs to my colleague erica sasaki from japan where she was able to generate for the very first time transgenic marmosets marmosets that express a foreign gene in this case the green fluorescence protein um, you know that was engineered into them um, you know and opening up a whole array of the genetic and genomics toolkits that is so well developed and white in widespread use with mice and bringing that to the uh, non-human primate domain and that really boosted the uh, significance of the marmoset as a biomedical research model we ourselves you know were very um, 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 quick to understand the significance of this um, uh, paper and we uh, started collaborating with erica sasaki and in our own work now, we have marmosets in our laboratory that express the genetically encoded calcium indicator GCAMP, um, which are proteins that um, they um, basically, they are inside neurons. And once the neurons activate with any functional activity, um, they fluoresce and using an optical microscope, you can capture that fluorescence of the brain and, and look at the um, cells, um, you know, in activity live and directly with direct visualization. Um, I'm not going to be talking about this work today uh, because my uh, talk today is all going to be focused on magnetic resonance imaging. But as I said in the beginning, one of the great attractants of marmosets is as an animal model is that they retain the primate anatomical and functional brain organization so that they we are able to really in studying marmosets learn a lot about the anatomical and functional organization of the human brain which is the you know ultimate reason for why we use animal models in the laboratory so that we can learn more and more about our own brain so marmosets um, like macaques um, they uh, have this stereotypical uh, anatomical and functional organization that allows us to really port you know many of the techniques that are used uh, in uh, human volunteers to um, the laboratory and um, map their brain and in understanding the anatomical and functional organization of their brain we are understanding the anatomical and functional organization of the human brain but another major advantage um, of marmosets especially for us who work with imaging techniques is that their brain is smooth um, this is what lysencephalic means lysa is smooth and encephalic is brain so marmosets don't have the complex folding um, of the um, human and macaque brain sensations and gyrations. And that makes it very easy to locate uh, an functional areas within their cortex because the um, surface is smooth. And we, this is you know, applicable for MRI, for optical imaging, and even for electrophysiology, placing and locating placing recording electrodes and locating functional brain areas in the smooth brain is really a trivial task. In the case of MRI, um, you know, we use high magnetic field strengths. So this is an example of a seven Tesla 30 centimeter uh, magnet that was particularly built for small animal models, including rodents, rats and mice, but marmosets, because they're small, they also fit in there really well. And we have here a picture of a marmoset that is in an anesthetized preparation um, under isofluorine anesthesia, you know, going in for uh, an anatomical scan inside the MRI. But because we also, we want to understand brain function, it's very important to develop the means to acquire images from the marmosets while they are awake so that they can participate in behavior studies. And my group has spent a lot of time and effort into developing the conditions for scanning the marmosets in fully awake conditions. And so these are the two basic setups that we do our studies with. 
no matter how um, the animal goes into the magnet, either anesthetized or awake, we pay very extensive attention to a proper physiological monitoring to ensure that the animals are happy inside the magnet in, in, in under normal physiological conditions in terms of temperature, heart rate, um, oxygenation levels uh, that we measure, you know, via pulse oximeters, and also we breathe, we monitor the breathing waveforms and look for entitled CO twos. This is really just to ensure that all the basic physiological parameters are normal, and therefore the data that we are acquiring from the marmosets is normal. So once the animal is ready to go in the magnet. Um, then this is the cartoon that shows that the animal goes in, usually in the sphinx position, which is the natural resting uh, position for the marmoset. Um, and, uh, you know, when the animal is awake, it's very important that the animal is there comfortable, um, very comfortable. So we also spent a lot of time designing a proper animal bed that keeps the animal comfort, comfortable and, and, and warm and um, in, in, in a good resting position um, so that the animal can participate in the studies without the influences of undue factors, for example, stress. Um, the animals are trained and acclimated to be inside the MRI so that they know that when they are inside the MRI, they are safe that nothing bad will happen to them. Quite on the contrary, they're going to have fun because they're going to engage in behavior tasks. For example, they're going to watch images and movies that are placed on a monitor um, right outside the magnet in direct uh, line of vision with them. And then we have a little uh, eye tracking camera that ensures that the animals are paying attention to the screen so that when we collect the data, we're collecting the data during these behavior tasks. And usually they stay there from um, as short a time as half an hour to about two, three hours without any problems. They get rewards for, for being in there and the data acquisition is really um, great. So in my talk today, I'm gonna um, talk about two projects that we've been doing, one which is more focused on understanding the anatomical organization of the marmoset brain. Um, and this is the marmoset brain atlas. Um, project and then the second project is more devoted to the functional aspects and uh, which is what I call the marmoset brain connectome project. So starting with the marmoset brain atlas project, this project just started when a postdoctoral uh, fellow um, came from uh, the University of Queensland in Australia um, to work with me, uh, Shirong Liu. He already had experience working with macaques and working with mice. But he recognized also that marmosets um, were very advantageous because they were small, um, almost like mice, but they were primates like the macaques. And 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 Sharon came to my laboratory um, to you know study the functional organization of the marmoset brain, and he asked me for the atlas of the marmoset brain at the time, and I said we don't have one. Um, you know, and he says, well, we need to create one. So his project in our lab became, you know, um, in creating this marmoset brain atlas project. So, um, you know, in atlases, usually what happens is that you, you get uh, a, a specimen, a, a brain, and you do histology, which is a two-dimensional technique by definition. You cut slices of the brain and you um, use very high resolution uh, histological uh, images, pictures, photographs of that brain, and, and an anatomist goes and marks all the different functional areas, right? So we didn't want to do it this way because MRI is intrinsically a three-dimensional technique. And because of this, then we wanted to use MRI to create our own atlas. So Shirong resorted to, instead of taking pictures or of brain slices, of getting an entire brain and doing uh, what we call a diffusion weighted MRI image, which um, because it's acquired with special properties uh, of multi-shell, gives us several different types of contrasts from um, T1 to T2 to fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity and all sorts of other physical parameters that we can use then to um, analyze and just based on the contrast of this multimodal images, um, manually label each brain region 
you know, so this is a very um, tedious and intensive work because you have to go by hand there. And whenever you see borders between the different areas of the brain, um, then um, you, that's where you draw your lines and you define the different uh, anatomical parcellations. But then once you get this, um, um, uh, this labeling, uh, if you look at the brain in all three dimensions, you see that there is inconsistencies between um, labels that happen in different planes. So Chirong um, used uh, diffusion properties, in particular columnar and isotropy, to basically improve their labelings and get rid of uh, these inconsistencies on, in the third uh, dimension there. And in the, in the end, he was able to come up with a parcellation that um, included 54 areas um, that were unambiguously labeled in each hemisphere of the brain. And from these 54 areas, the, he could then um, decimate them to 13 location-based areas that are more like you know front, side, back, um, top, bottom, et cetera. Or um, he could do um, functional connectivity to further refine this 54 areas into 106 areas in what is called a connectivity-based um, atlas now. So I'm not going to dwell too much time on, on, on this just because this work was published in 2018, but it's um, what we call the version one of our Marmoset Brain Atlas project, um, which you can find in this website. And you can go there and download not only the um, anatomical templates that Chiron produced, but also the data that we used to produce uh, this. And you know, um, um, all this is, is available in there. But one is of, of the things that we recognized in, in looking at this data that Sharon corrected was that, you know, the main determinant of the quality of our data was the spatial resolution. And indeed, uh, MRI is now approaching um, spatial resolutions that are almost comparable to microscopy. We could, for example, collect within a reasonable amount of time um, a three-dimensional DTI image of the marmoset brain with 80 microns isotropic resolution. So in all directions, you have 80 microns. And you have here the different contrasts. So for example, this is T2, this is the fractional, fractional and isotropy um, there. Um, this is um, a uh, T1. Um, and you can see you know, how well-defined the different anatomical areas throughout the brain um, are. And, you know, just to give you an example of the power of the high resolution, if you go from 80 microns in this DTI sequence that takes several days to acquire to this um, uh, 50 microns isotropic resolution on a T2 star um, here that um, um, takes a few hours to acquire, you see that even though you have a little bit less details on the, on the 50 microns due to the contrast, um, you have much higher anatomical definition with the 50 micron images. And this is really what is pushing this project forward. So in recognizing this, Chiron decided to reacquire the 150 microns data from version one of the Atlas into this 80 microns uh, uh, data here. And he even went forward and he got half a brain and from a half a brain, he acquired in 64 microns. And you know, I could spend the entire day just looking at these images and learning something you new know, just because of the richness of the anatomical details that we have. And this is really our goal is to um, try and obtain uh, these maps with as high spatial resolution as possible. Um, for example, I said that we are starting to compare these images to histology, and this is true. Here's a histological image going through the corona radiata of uh, the white matter. And you see with histology, great details of the size of the fibers, the myelinated fibers, and you see where they are and how dense they are. But it's very hard to actually make up an individual fiber and know in which direction of the brain they're going through, just because um, the amount of information is limited. When you bring in the diffusion and you put colors on, on the different directions of the fibers, then you really see uh, how much richer the information um, is. And, and so version two of our Marmoset Brain Atlas was really focused on looking at the white matter pathways 
um, you know, and, and now complete the view of the marmoset. So Shirong looked at this data and you saw how long it takes for the data to load into the PowerPoint slides so that the movie starts showing to you. That's because it is a very large data set um, that really contains a lot of information. So the same way that Shirong made the labeling of all the cortical areas in gray matter, um, he also spent a whole year labeling the white matter pathways that he identified with 80 microns resolutions. And, and this constituted version two, um, which now is a combined atlas of both gray and white matter. And this was also published um, you know, last year. And I believe I already um, even presented um, this data uh, in a previous talk in, in Hiberion Preto um, for this. So then what was next? What would version three be? So version one and version two were both focused on uh, imaging a single brain. But um, just like us humans, marmosets have a lot of variability in the brain size with both age and sex. Males and females have different brain sizes. And, you know, of course, as the animal is growing, the, the brain, the skull is increasing. And then after it reaches a peak, you know, the brain starts to um, suffer some atrophy and starts to shrink. So it was very important for us to look at this variability across a population of animals. So version three, which was published earlier this year, um, is focused on a population of 27 animals for which we obtained an entire um, profile of different contrasts, including T1, T2, uh, myelin based and DTI. And using this, um, we did population based um, analysis that led us to the creation of a population based atlas. And basically, it means that for each animal, there is a pipeline where we acquire the, the data, as I showed in the previous slide, T1, T2, DTI. And from that, then, um, you know, we do a pre-processing and template construction that includes registering um, these brains to a common uh, frame uh, work. And then we do tissue segmentation and we apply the atlas to label the different areas and then we use uh, tools that are used in the human uh, fMRI processing like FreeSurfer and Afni and Suma with the Connectome Workbench to con uh, construct surfaces and flat maps. And we do this, you know, for the average uh, population brain atlas and because we know the registration from each animal to the average template, then we can go back from the average template to, back to each animal and then we can port this parcellation back into that animal and with this then we have the uh, population based atlas that um, includes both uh, gray matter and white matter and cerebellum um, um, structures in there so um, this work is now in um, um, published in, in their image and what are the things that we can do so for example we can look at our population and, and study um, the uh, average um, whole head volume or the intracranial volume or the brain volume, the cortex, the cerebellum, et cetera. Um, and we, we can see each individual um, in there, but we can see how that individual relates to the rest of the population. Where does it sit in this violin type curves? And also, how does sex affect you know, the variability in the brain? So, for example, we see a, a larger variability in males in, in the whole head volume than uh, females, although they have just about the same variability in the cortex or, or, or the cerebellum or their brain volume, right? So, so this is um, um, one of the interesting things that we can do we can um, ask very easily which one is the smallest of our animals or which one is the largest of our animals, just basically by clicking on any of these dots and um, that animal gets identified. But also what is important is that we are able to produce this population-based surfaces that then, you know, if you don't wanna work with a single individual, you, it, it, it would be better that you uh, work with the population um, average because then you know that you are more or less um, studying the mean um, sort of marmoset brain, the, the mean stereotypical marmoset brain. 
But getting all this data allows us to do a lot of post uh, acquisition processing. So for example, we could get the cortex of the animals and flatten it so that we study this um, uh, functional organization of, of the anatomy, uh, you know, the terms get a little bit confusing because yes, we're looking at anatomical parcellations, but they have a functional meaning, right? And we can look at them as if, you know, the whole brain was flattened like a pancake on a flat um, surface on a table on a current top, for example, and then we can see different areas. So for example, this is the primary visual cortex, this is secondary visual cortex in there, or you can ask, okay, um, you know, in my animals, what is the variation in cortical thickness? Um, and, and here it is. So, you know, the V1 is, is very thick. You know, A1 is very thick in terms of cortex, you know, in this area here in the um, inferior um, prefrontal cortex is not as thick, it's, it's much thinner, right? You can look at areas that um, uh, have high myelination. So for example, area MT, MT here is heavily myelinated. Uh, the primary visual cortex is heavily myelinated. And you can ask this both on an individual level or you can ask this in terms of a population level. So um, we, we have been spending a lot of time and effort developing these tools because I think not, not only they will enable our own studies, but they're gonna be very useful for the entire neuroscience community, especially um, the investigators that are interested in understanding the organization of the marmoset brain and also understanding um, you know, um, the, how marmosets sit in the evolutionary axis with re respect to other primate species, including us humans. A second part of my talk now relates to the functional aspects of it um, and we've been doing a lot of uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging um, data acquisition and analysis of the marmosets um, fmri right and one of the greatest requests that we have is like number one can you share your data and number two can you share your results right and um based on on these requests you know we decided that we, we should continue um, with the great success of the Marmoset Brain Mapping Project and now create a Marmoset Brain Connectome Project. And um, this, this, this project, uh, you know, took advantage of a second person coming to my lab. I've always been very uh, lucky to have the brightest people working with me, like uh, Renata, right? And uh, David Schaefer, he came to my lab from uh, Western Uni um, University in Toronto, in, in uh, London, Ontario. And uh, uh, David uh, has been uh, one of the most prolific, you know, publishers in Marmoset fMRI uh, works. And uh, he uh, has a ton of data that he says we need to really come up with a way to look at this data very efficiently. So we decided to create this um, website um, you can click on it and, and you're going to, you know, basically um, go there and, and you're going to see uh, for yourself. So this is a screenshot from the website that basically shows to you that you, you can now, on a population of marmosets, interrogate their functional connectivity. So um, this is just basically an overview of the rest of my talk where I'm going to talk about the features of this uh, marmoset brain connectome project. Uh, how we acquired the data, what are the metrics of its quality assurance. And then I'm gonna um, demonstrate, you know, what can you use it for, you know, so that you have an idea of its utilities, right? So here is an overview of the features. So basically what we did was um, in a, a population of 32 animals, we collected resting state functional MRI data. So resting state functional MRI data is when you place the animal in the magnet, but you do not ask the animal to do anything. The animal is just sitting there, essentially doing nothing or resting. And while the animal is resting, we are collecting this uh, series of bold um, images um, in three dimensions with a spatial resolution of 500 microns isotropic. Um, these images come every two seconds. Uh, that's how long it takes to scan the whole brain. And then we repeat and again and again and again. And the animals are there for runs of um, anywhere from 10 to 17 minutes per run. And then we repeat, you know, six to eight runs per animal per day, you know, so that they go back um, to, to their home 
um, cache and you know we repeat again the next day so but then once you collect this data you know if you look at any one voxel um, a, a volume element of the image you can collect this time courses and then you look at the time courses of the neighboring voxels here and you basically look for how similar or dissimilar they are and based on that you create uh, functional correlation maps that, of course, are in 3D because, you know, the voxels span the entire brain. So you produce this functional connectivity uh, uh, or functional correlation maps, and um, I'm going to show this to you. And then based on, on, on these maps, then you can bring in the atlas that we generated um, in the first project and overlay the atlas and then ask which regions are connected to which regions. and the website will tell you that you can also you know in this website in addition to loading this functional correlations you can look at the raw data of each of the animals and download the data so if you want to reproduce this work by yourself you can all this data is fully available and free uh, for you to download um, and and test all, all the methods and come up with even uh, different you know metrics if you want to um, and so um, the data was collected from, like I said, 32 animals. Uh, five of these animals came, came from the University of Western Ontario in London, um, where uh, David Schaefer was. That was acquired at 9.4 Tesla. And the other 27 animals were acquired at the NIH um, at the 7 Tesla uh, magnetic field strength, right? But um, in any case, the data was acquired, like I said, with 500 microns isotropic resolution from um, fully awake uh, marmosets. And this is how the marmosets look. So, so this is the marmoset brain mapping template that I showed in the first part of my talk, um, overlaid into an average brain here. And then um, we see um, how that template relates to each of the different individuals. And you see that the registration is excellent. You see variabilities. You see animals that have slightly longer uh, brains or slightly wider brains or slightly shorter uh, brains. But in overall, um, our software is really able to do a great job with the registrations of each individual to the common template. And then based on, on, on after they are on template, like I said, we plot this time courses, putting seeds either in gray matter shown here in green or white matter shown in brown or even CSF shown in blue, the cerebrospinal fluid. And you can basically um, do 1.8 billion possible comparisons for each animal at 500 microns um, spatial resolution. So it goes to show to you how computationally intensive this data is. And, and that was one of the main reasons for why we decided that it would be nice for us to do these calculations, store that um, in the cloud so that you don't have to repeat these calculations because they take forever. Uh, they take several days to um, compute, right? So this is an example correlation, for example, where we put a, a seed point in uh, area 8 AV in the prefrontal cortex of the marmoset. And this is the group average map um, that shows, of course, the highest region being just around the seed, but on also lots of other areas that correlate with high with 8 AV. And you see how this correlation translates to each of the animals that contribute to the group. And you see that, you know, in, in you can definitely see differences um, in, in certain animals, but you can definitely see that most of them have this, you know, group average pattern. So going to show that the reproducibility is great, but there is also some variability, right? So to quantify what was um, generating the variability, we decided to look at the uh, mean and, and variance of uh, this correlations as a function of the number of scans that we used. Um, and sure enough, the more scans that you have, the matter, but uh, the better. But um, it comes a point where you know it, it doesn't justify you going, for example, above 80 runs because by 80 runs, you know your variance is as you know, as it gets. And and here we see you know how the data vary as a function of runs. So for example. Um, here is the seed overlaid on top of the map in area 8AV. And if you only do two runs, 
you see that it's very hard to see any correlations at all. But then as you go to four runs, if you squint your eyes, you start seeing these islands of red uh, coming to high correlations. Eight runs, um, you know, it's trying to get much, much better. By 32 runs, you definitely have the final pattern um, here, very, very visible. And of course, in going to 64 and, and 128 increases the statistical power of that, but the, the shape of the correlation is already established with as little as eight runs, right? So, um, and, and, and this is a, a plot of the variance um, showing that essentially, um, you know, once you get to 64 runs or so, you know, you essentially have no variance anymore and you're just basically adding, um, you know, data, but not contributing anymore to the improvement in signal to noise, right? So, um, what you do basically when you go to the website is you have the 3D image of the average template um, in, in there and you can click on any voxel and once you click on a voxel with the cursor you click on this button load voxel correlation and a correlation appears so for example um, this is um, a voxel in the temporal um, area um, of the marmoset brain here and when you click you know, the load correlation, a map shows up um, here that, that shows you what are the areas um, connected to, to the area. So it's as simple as that, right? But that correlation has already been calculated for you, um, you know, ahead of time and stored um, in the cloud so that you don't need to wait for all this very computationally intensive calculations to be done. The map just loads up very, very quickly. So um, examples of use of this resource includes making hypothesis-based correlations. So you wanna test, for example, what area is connected to the rest of the brain, you can do that. Um, you can verify um, that the results that you get with task-based fMRI um, when the animal is doing a behavior um, uh, make sense from the resting state functional connectivity because the areas are naturally connected. Or you can also use this for pre-surgical mapping or for comparison with other modalities such as histochemical tracing. So for example, in terms of hypothesis-based correlations, um, you can look at the location of the frontal eye field, right? Not by clicking on the frontal eye field, you could do that as well. But what we decided to do is this. We hypothesized that the superior colliculus, um, which is an area deeply involved in visual, the processing of visual information, is connected to the frontal eye fields. So what we decided to do is we decided to place a cursor in the superior colliculus and load the correlation. And when we loaded the correlation, we went to see what areas in the prefrontal cortex of the animals um, you know, were correlated with the superior colliculus and the frontal eye fields certainly uh, were uh, one of them. So you see this positive correlation. Um, another question is, what is the cerebellum connected to? So we put a voxel um, in the cerebellum, our cursor in the cerebellum, and we clicked load correlation, and we see um, all these areas here. What is in red is positively correlated to the cerebellum. Um, and um, what is in blue is negatively correlated to the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is actually connected to uh, the entire brain. And you see a lot of, for example, V1 anti-correlated to the cerebellum, but you also see areas in the medial prefrontal cortex of the marmoset that are connected to the cerebellum. And this is, um, to the best of our knowledge, is not being reported before. So it's one of the things, right? You. Uh, that you can find out. We says what is you know any area X of the brain connected to, and then you, when you get these maps, now you go try to understand why are they connected together, and we, you learn a lot about both the anatomical and functional organization of the marmoset brain. Another thing that we can do is um, compare um, our resting state fMRI with test-based fMRI to look at whether results that we obtained with the test-based fMRI make sense. So for example, the, in this study here um, that is published in Nature Communications, um, David was looking at the areas along the temporal cortex that are processing information um, related to faces, the analysis of faces. So the animals are in the magnet and we have this intercalation of blocks of rest with blocks in which 
the stimulus is a face of a marmoset um, showing up on the screen. Now, the, different, the difference is that in here, sometimes you, the animals are going to be looking straight at the um, test subject. And in other times, the animals will be looking away, which is called an averted gaze. gaze right? And we wanted to see, um, David wanted to see, if um, the face patches um, would highlight in both um, occasions. And so he produced maps um, that show the functional activation with directed gaze versus averted gaze. And this is the difference. And the differences are really related to the face patches. When the animal um, on the screen is looking away, you cannot really detect its face um, really well, right? But when the animal is looking directly um, at the, the test animal, then yes, the test animal can detect the face as well. And so the difference is um, this um, discrete areas along the extra straight um, cortex, the temporal lobe, that are the so-called face patches, right? Interestingly, also, there was an area in the prefrontal cortex, area 47L, that was also related to the faces that showed up in the subtraction of uh, the uh, images. And, and so to confirm this, you know, you put a cursor in that area 47 elf with resting state functional connectivity. And you see that indeed lots of areas along the extra straight uh, pathway of the temporal lobe are connected to that area as well. Another area was area 24 um, C that you know did not um, correlate um, with um, the most frontal batch, right? So you can really test whether the task-based fMRI data that you get makes sense or not. Another very popular and important application is um, um, to decide where do you want to um, place your electrodes if you're going to do electrophysiology or where are you going to inject um, um, you know, pharmacological agents like mucimol to inactivate areas or where you're going to put optogenetic probes via uh, viral mediated constructs. So what you can do is you can um, choose um, a seed in a specific area. So here's again the superior colliculus, right? And then you ask, what are the areas of the brain that are connected to the superior colliculus? And uh, area 8AAV, um, which is right here, um, was um, connected to it, as we said. So, in, and then, you know, the experiment would be okay, we want to record from area 8AV as we're presenting um, visual stimulus to the animal. So you can do two things, you know, to record from it. You can just basically from the atlas extract the stereotactic coordinates, which are shown here in red. So because it's really uh, uh, hard to read, I'm putting them here. X 6.8, Y 17.4, and Z 11.8 millimeters. And you just basically transfer those straight to the stereotactic um, uh, frame with the animal there and you do uh, the insertion of the electrode right there and that you should be within area 8AV. Um, another way that you can do is just basically get this coordinates here and back transform from the population uh, based template to a specific animal um, and find what those coordinates are for that particular animal and then you go and you implant your arrays right there. And, and uh, this is what David did on this particular case. And, um, you know, after implanting the electrodes, um, he did a CT of uh, the animal just to verify that the electrodes were in the right position and indeed they were. So um, you can use the, the maps for this pre-surgical planning purposes. And finally, you can, um, compare um, the resting state fMRI data that you get from the marmosets with other modalities. So for example, our colleagues, uh, Piotr Maika and Marcello Rosa of uh, Australia, they have developed this marmoset brain connectivity atlas in which they used um, uh, tracers, anatomical tracers to um, basically inject a target area and see what other areas of the brain show up. And you can Im uh, imagine how hard of a problem this is to do because you have to use many, many animals to trace from every single cortical area of the brain um, to other areas. 
But, you know, also the data that they obtain, while extremely useful, has some limitations. And here's, for example, uh, a case where um, he's, um, they, uh, we're interested in Area 46, which is a, um, um, a, an area in the uh, prefrontal cortex right here. Um, and we ask, okay, if we do our functional connectivity tracing from Area 46, what does the map show? So the map shows these areas in red that I said are positively correlated with Area 46, and also areas in blue, which are negatively correlated with um, Area 46 or anti-correlated. Uh, when you compare the fMRI, uh, resting state fMRI data, with the uh, histological tracing data, you see the overlap of the black areas, which are the direct connections via anatomical tracers, they overlap perfectly with the red areas, indicating that our resting state functional connectivity maps are showing the direct connections as you know positively directly correlated, right? But if you look at this area here, you don't see the blue areas. And the reason why you don't see the blue areas is you know, questionable. Why don't you see them? Well, it could be for two reasons. It could be that the areas are not connected or they are connected, but not directly connected. They are connected you know, via uh, different num a different number of synapses greater than one synapse. And the tracers that Marcello and Piotr used were monosynaptic tracers. They never leave um, the cells. So once they get into the cell, you're basically mapping that same cell in an axonal process that goes to the target area but nothing else from the target area to other areas. So our resting state fMRI map is showing here in blue, um, possibly areas that are indirectly connected to area um, 46. And therefore the map that we obtain is giving us additional information that you cannot obtain from, um, uh, from the histological um, tracing data. So um, we have a whole array of ideas on how to take this project forward. Um, and um, these um, they revolve around two things. Number one is we have a very large colony here at the University of Pittsburgh where we have more than 200 animals currently. And they have not been scanned yet because our 9.4 Tesla MRI here at the University of Pittsburgh was just delivered last month and we are waiting for the renovations of the lab to complete before we can energize the magnet. But once we do energize the magnet, we intend to collect data from these hundreds of animals, not only at a single time point, but at several time points so that we can start looking at age trajectories and how this anatomical and functional organization of the marmoset changes you know, with lifespan. Um, the other thing that we want to do is we want to continue to include data that is not only MRI based, but it also multimodal uh, based. So, for example, one of the instruments that we also obtained in our lab now, it's a PET CT uh, um, instrument that will be very useful for our studies with marmoset models of Alzheimer's disease. And with that, we're going to be able to basically compare PET images and CT images. So for example, here's a CT of, uh, of uh, a marmoset um, skeleton, um, you know, and compare the status with the fMRI and incorporate um, them to the fMRI. Um, the, like I said, one of the direct premises of our work is that, you know, it's no good if we don't share what we're doing with the rest of the community. So um, given this success uh, and popularity of uh, the two websites, Marmoset Brain Mapping and Marmoset Brain Connect Home, we decided that, you know, moving forward, we really need to continue to invest in developing this open access resources for the Marmoset neuroscientific apparatus. And so, um, the Brain Connect Home um, already exists with the fMRI. We're going to add hardwares in there um, with the 
Now, you know, technology of 3D printing being so good, both on the printers that are really precise and the materials that, um, you know, you can do anything with them from doing very hard structures to also flexible structures like masks and, and, and helmets. Um, you can print everything. There is no need to reinvent wheels. Whenever we um, decide to print something like, you know, the animal bed or the stereotactic frame, or MRI phantoms, um, or you know, um, anesthesia masks, or behavioral apparatus that we use for testing behaviors in, in the animals. We're also going to open um, a, you know um, a subfolder in our Marmoset Brain Connectome website called marmosetbrainconnectome.org/hardware, where we're going to deposit all the CAD files there, so that if anyone who has access to a 3D printer wants to download these files and print them, um, you, you're welcome to. And, and, and this way, you know, you can do things. And we think that in doing so, we're not only um, instigating, you know, making the marmosets even more popular in research, but also uh, we're instigating the reproducibility aspect in which, um, you know, by people using the same type of hardware, you know, they're likely going to get very comparable data that will allow us to basically share in all of this. So collaborations are always very welcome. Uh, and if you have a particular interest in either downloading our data um, or um, uploading data, contributing data, please contact either David Schaefer or me uh, at this uh, email addresses or if you need uh, any help with using the website um, as well. So um, this is the end of my talk, and I want to uh, thank um, the, the entire group that um, is here. This is the, the current lab as we were, you know, um, out there on Fifth Avenue in Pittsburgh um, waiting for the magnet to, to arrive. You know, these are COVID times, so you can't see anybody here because we're all um, behind masks, right? But I'm very indebted to, to the present um, group, but also to... Um, several of the previous members, in particular for the Marmoset work, Daniel Papotti, um, who works at uh, UFABC and San Bernardo. Um, he's been crucial in the development of our um, uh, coil technologies. Ciso Yen in acquiring of the data. Shirong Liu, who's now uh, his own show at the Institute of Neuroscience in China. And then, of course, all the group from Western um, University who uh, collected the data that contributed to the Connectome um, project. And I also want to thank the general support from the NIH and the Pennsylvania Department of Health, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Obrigada, Afonso. Nossa, essas, essas imagens de alta resolução, a gente fica né, maravilhado sem ver. Eu acho que a, a Vivian talvez coloque aqui as, as perguntas. Pronto. Temos aqui uma pergunta do Bruno. Ele perguntou se as sequências de pulso usadas normalmente em humanos requerem alguma adaptação quando são usadas em saguis. Ah, você pode repetir a pergunta de novo? Então, as sequências normalmente requerem alguma adaptação? Sim. As principais adaptações são relacionadas justamente à alta resolução. Né? Então, tem adaptações tanto em hardware como adaptações em software. Em hardware, a gente usa, por exemplo, gradientes que têm uma potência bem maior né? e um campo de gradiente efetivo maior. Uh, mas, uh, em termos de, de, da sequência em si, um, a sequência é a mesma. Por exemplo, uma sequência MVP Rage para você fazer ponderação em T1 é a mesma, não importa se você está no 7 Tesla ou 3 Tesla clínico versus nosso 7 Tesla para a né? O que varia somente é que a nossa sequência vai deixar você colocar lá a resolução espacial desejada, 200, 250 uh, microns, né? enquanto que na sua máquina clínica ele não vai deixar você fazer isso. <risos> Aqui é uma do André. Oi, André. Ele colocou que da primeira parte né, da, da apresentação, uh -huh. uh, do you find SAR problems equipping the marmosets a long time inside the scanner? 
no. especially for diffusion data. No, no, actually, uh, the diffusion data is, is has no problems with SAR at all. Uh, the problems that we have are with the gradient uh, strengths, especially when you want to go to high B values. It's a multi-shell sequence. Um, we use two shells, uh, basically B0 plus two uh, spheres. Uh, I think one is um, uh, 1500 and the other one is 2500, something like that on that order, right? And um, Obviously, because of time, you need to repeat it fast, you know, so that you acquire all the data as quickly as you can, and even as quickly as you can, it's, it's not quick enough. It's it's about an hour uh, of acquisition. So you have to just keep an eye on the temperature of the gradients, um, in, and it hasn't been a problem for us uh, because we have a good cooling system, but no SAR issues at all. Essa, essa eu tinha lido, achei interessante também. É, do you plan to create a vascular territory atlas as well? We would be very curious. <risos> Grande ideia. E sim, está nos planos. É, é interessante que a gente estava falando sobre eficiência né, e quanto tempo leva para fazer essas aquisições em alta resolução. E por causa do, dos longos tempos de repetição TR, Uh, as sequências de arterial spin labeling, elas são bem ineficientes né, em termos de tempo, né? Mas é, seria realmente excelente a gente tentar conseguir fazer esses vascular territories. E agora, com essa máquina nova, nós temos é, é, várias coisas que auxiliam a gente né, em termos de diminuir o tempo de aquisição. É, a gente vai estar com 16 canais de recepção e 4 canais de transmissão. Né? Então, isso vai ajudar bastante com a, a parte de eficiência, que é o que tem proibido a gente de obter esses vascular territories. Mas sim. Ótimo. É. Aqui, a Alessandra perguntou quais são os principais desafios na criação de mapas cerebrais como esses nos seres humanos. Obrigado pelas, por essa pergunta, pergunta bastante importante. O desafio principal é você ter é, o sinal suficiente na resolução que você quer. Né? Então, é, por exemplo, é, no caso do, dos primeiros mapas que, que eu mostrei na, na, na primeira parte da, da palestra, que foram mapas adquiridos com resolução espacial de 150 microns, ou 80 microns, ou 64 microns, Certo? É, o sinal é minúsculo, então você tem que tirar muitas médias para poder, é, poder distinguir as coisas bem. Né? E, e, e é, o tempo é, é, é o principal nisso. Né? Quando você vai para a parte funcional, é, que agora os saguis, logicamente, não só eles estão vivos lá, mas eles estão também acordados e você tem que ser bem mais eficiente, a primeira coisa que a gente tem que sacrificar é a resolução espacial. Né? Então, as resoluções espaciais das imagens em vivo são 250 microns para as anatômicas, T1, T2 e, e, e DTI, e 500 microns para a bold funcional. É, o nosso plano é continuar investindo o máximo que a gente pode em tecnologia de radiofrequência e em construir bobinas novas, não, por exemplo, agora o, o Daniel aí em, em São Carlos e, e São Bernardo, ele acabou de fazer uma bobina nova de oito canais para a gente, já está começando a fazer uma de 16 canais, né? essas bobinas vão ajudar bastante. Ótimo, temos uma... Ah, do professor Garrido aqui. Agradeceu pela excelente palestra, e existem estudos longitudinais em andamento, e que modelos de doenças estão em estudos, e se foi obtido uh, um atlas de tratos. Sim. Uh, oi, oi, Garrido, uh, que bom uh, ver suas perguntas aí. Uh, sim, os, os estudos longitudinais uh, uh, são uma das grandes prioridades nossas, que são justamente obter essas trajetórias do tempo, né, em, em que a gente está basicamente uh, olhando logo depois que o, o sagui nasce, com, assim que ele completa dois meses, ele já está completamente independente dos pais, então, a gente começa com dois meses de idade e segue até três anos, que é justamente a fase uh, pré-adulta, né? E, 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 e a partir dos três anos, então, de três anos até 11, 12 anos, é, é a parte de envelhecimento. 
né, é muito importante a gente é, obter esses estudos longitudinais. E, e aí, as nossas metas são é, de justamente olhar como é que o cérebro está mudando no tempo, tanto na parte anatômica como na organização funcional. Os modelos de doença, eu não tive tempo de falar hoje sobre eles, mas é um estudo que a gente está bastante excitado aqui, é, bastante né, orgulhoso, inclusive, é que a gente desenvolveu um modelo de sagui é, transgênico para Alzheimer's disease, né, para o mal de Alzheimer's, e que esse, esse modelo, ele é baseado em mutações no, no gene presinilina 1, que é o gene que causa a Alzheimer's familiar, que é Alzheimer's que tem é, um, um tempo de aparecimento bem, bastante curto, né? Então, o que a gente fez foi a gente é, é, trabalhou em colaboração com o Departamento de Neurologia da Universidade de Pittsburgh, eles têm um dos centros de pesquisa em Alzheimer's mais antigos do país, está em funcionamento desde 1985, e ele tem várias famílias uh, de pacientes que têm essas mutações genéticas que uh, causam essa Alzheimer's com o tempo de aparecimento rápido, né, em, em torno de 35 anos nos humanos, e o que a gente fez foi pegar uh, duas famílias que têm mutações em presenilina 1, e nós modelamos isso no sagui, e obtemos, eh, obtivemos o nascimento já de, de seis animais eh, em 2020, e tem mais dois ou três agora que estão para nascer no final desse mês, agora em, em julho. Esses animais já estão mostrando níveis de, de, de eh, como é que a gente fala, de, de, basicamente de expressão de amiloide bastante elevados, eh, né, e... Eh, Renata, isso tem que ser uma outra palestra que eu tenho que dar, certo? Porque é muito interessante mesmo, né? E, e o que a gente está só esperando agora é, é o, o MRI e o PET-CT para a gente ver se essas placas já estão no cérebro. A gente tirou amostras de sangue e já consegue detectar níveis bastante elevados de amiloides. E no final, foi obtido um atlas de tratos, e eu acho que tratos, você deve estar tá falando dos tratos de matéria branca, e a resposta é sim, é a versão 2 do, 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 do Marmoset. O paper foi publicado em Nature Neuroscience em 2020, mas se você vai para o marmosetbrainmapping.org, certo? É só você olhar lá, a versão 2 é, é, tem os tratos. Que foi o que a gente usou, o, os mapas de 80 microns para fazer. O Bruno pergunta aqui sobre as imagens bold, né, as funcionais, se a HRF e as bandas de frequência desse sinal bold são similares com o que a gente tem em humanos. É, a HRF, ela é um pouco mais rápida, né, é, é o, o, o tempo de pico dela, e esse também eu, eu poderia ter incluído nessa palestra, mas eu, eu não incluí porque eu apresentei isso já numa, numa palestra anterior, uh, antes do Covid, aí em Ribeirão, é, é, o tempo de pico dela é em torno de 2 a 3 segundos somente, e o, como é que você chama, o full width, a half maximum, é em torno de 4 segundos. Né? Então, ela, ela é mais rápida do que os humanos, né? mas ela é mais, mais é, atrasada do que, por exemplo, dos roedores, dos ratos e, 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 e camundongos. Então, ela está seguindo mais ou menos bem em termos de tamanho do cérebro. É... As bandas de frequência são as mesmas do sinal, certo? Então, a gente analisa tudo na mesma, nas mesmas bandas de frequência para bold, é, né, é 0.1 hertz ou abaixo, né? E, e se você está mencionando em termos das bandas de frequência de eletrofisiologia, que é alfa, beta, gama, etc., são as mesmas também. Temos várias perguntas aqui no chat. Ah. Aqui é da Alvana. Perguntando quanto tempo dura as sequências de DTI para se obter né, com essa resolução e se já exploraram a conectividade estrutural dos marmosetes com relação a doenças neurodegenerativas. Oi, Johanna, tudo bom? É, é, a resolução, é, ela depende da resolução, então, é, a, as imagens com 250 microns a gente consegue obter em mais ou menos uma a duas horas de aquisição. 
certo? Mas para fazer 80 microns ou 64 microns, são vários dias, e, e, e talvez eu, eu não tenha explicado direito, mas a gente obteve essas imagens ex vivo, né, com um, um cérebro perfundido, com, com é, formalina. Né? Então, levou vários dias, a, a de 150 microns levou uma semana, de 80 microns levou duas semanas de, de aquisição. É, e, realmente, é, é o, o tempo que, que precisa para adquirir essas imagens é um problema sério. É, a segunda pergunta, vocês já exploraram a conectividade estrutural dos marmosetes com relação a doenças neurodegenerativas? Já. É, a gente fez um estudo em marmosetes normais, é, só olhando a função da idade, a gente vê uma redução bastante grande do, dos resting state networks, em particular o default mode network, ele é um dos, dos networks que... Uh, a intensidade do, do, da conexão entre os módulos diferentes, da, da, os hubs diferentes do default mode network, ele cai bastante com a idade, e a gente tem a hipótese de que isso vai ser mais acelerado ainda na presença de doenças neurodegenerativas como Alzheimer's, né, ou stroke, ou uh, multiple sclerosis, certo? E isso são todos estudos em andamento. Um dos, dos grandes problemas... <risos> É, né, de, de fazer essas aquisições, é de que a gente precisa de múltiplos é, pontos né, ao longo da idade do, dos animais. Né? Então, esses são dados que vão surgir aos poucos, mas é, a gente está olhando eles. É, acho que nós vamos para uma última pergunta aqui, que a gente já bateu mais de né, uma hora. É. Uh, os mapas de difusão eles foram obtidos com técnicas de super resolução ou são 3D isotrópicas? São 3D isotrópicas mesmo, a, a, a única coisa que a gente fez foi acelerar, é, porque a gente tinha é, múltiplos canais, né, então a gente fez uma aceleração com fator de 2, né, é, é, sense, né, fator de 2, de aceleração 2, eu acho que também usou um pouquinho de fator de Fourier, neles, para diminuir o número de phase encoding steps, então você, em vez de adquirir só metade do, que é do espaço K, você adquire algumas linhas a mais e com isso você consegue reconstruir é, o espaço K completamente. Então, acho que é isso. Tem outras perguntas aqui no chat, mas é, eu conheço aqui os alunos, então depois eu passo essas perguntas para o Afonso e ele da responder para a gente, aí eu repasso lá para os alunos, senão a gente vai ficar aqui, ó, até a hora do almoço. É, antes de agradecer e finalizar, só queria lembrar o pessoal que hoje é o último seminário do, do semestre, né, desse primeiro semestre, e que os seminários FAMP, eles retornam, então, no dia 18 de agosto, ok? Então, eu agradeço novamente, Afonso, foi ótimo, a gente adorou, e já vai deixar aqui na lista para o próximo seminário em, nos modelos de Alzheimer, que a gente tem muito interesse nisso. Não, o prazer é, é todo meu, eu, você sabe que eu, eu nem titubeei em aceitar seu convite, porque, uh, em grande parte, certo, minha última viagem antes do Covid foi justamente a viagem para Ribeirão Preto, né, que foi em fevereiro, eu acho, né, e, Isso. É, e não vejo a hora de voltar, então, é, se Deus quiser, todo mundo vai estar tá vacinado logo, logo, né, e a gente vai estar tá de volta ao normal, Assim esperamos logo, né? É isso. <risos> isso. Então, a gente finaliza por aqui. Obrigadão de novo e até mais, Obrigado pessoal. Obrigado, gente. Um abraço.